Praise the Lord, everybody. There we go. Track three, please. What a joy divine Leaning on The everlasting arms What a blessedness <laughs> What a peace is mine Leaning on The everlasting arms Leaning I'm leaning safe and secure from all the alarms. Yes, I'm leaning. I'm leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Now this is the part I like. What have I to dread? <laughs> what have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. That's because I'm leaning on the everlasting come on sing it if you know it said i'm leaning i'm leaning i'm safe and secure from all the alarms yes i'm leaning i'm leaning on you jesus I'm leaning, leaning on the everlasting on. Oh my, 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 my. Oh. Thank you, God. Oh. Come on, one more time, saints. Said I'm leaning, I'm leaning. You know that we're safe and we're secure from all the alarms. Yes, I'm leaning, I'm leaning on you, Jesus. I'm leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms. God bless you. Good evening. Good evening. That was kind of pitiful. <laughs> I said, good evening. good evening. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Yes, Somebody ought to kick out an amen. amen. That's what we have in Jesus. His precious prevailing strength 
in our lives. Can I get a witness tonight? I'm very happy along with the rest of you to be here. The brethren have been very kind to me, Dr. Cox, and that they've invited me several times over the past five years. I've not been able to come because of schedule, and they've honored me by persisting. I'm glad to be here tonight. This is a wonderful tradition, is it not? One for which we can be proud, and I, I take some joy, Pastor Bird, in the fact that the very first one, 26 years ago, I was a presenter, and I'm glad to see the tradition has continued. The brethren wanted me to say a word about prophecy. The prophetic utterance, this unique golden cord of scripture that separates it from all other books. You should have said amen. amen. It is prophecy. I say again, it is prophecy that separates the Bible from all other good books. For in prophecy, God sets himself aside from the authors of all other literature. It is one thing to write sweet words, another to pen poetry of outstanding mental titillation, but when you can say on Wednesday what's gonna take place on the next Friday and it take place exactly the way you say, that's a whole nother level of literature. I'll say amen for you. When you can grab right now and talk about right now, standing on right now, and see the next decade as clear as a bell and say, thus saith the Lord. And when the Lord gets done speaking, you can just write it down. If he says rain 500 years from now, then on that morning, get up with your umbrella because God has declared, I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. But you can't help but get excited when you recognize you have this powerful tool in your hand. You can look through the windows and see tomorrow. Prophecy. No, no, no. Seventh-day Adventist people. I don't mean to eat insult anybody else, but Seventh-day Adventist people ought to be people who understand and preach with courage the prophecies of the Bible. And in my age, 41 years of ministry now, 63 years old, still as happy as a lark in the Lord's work, you couldn't pay me to do anything else. But I'm getting a little agitated because in these days when God has already tickled our minds by 911, tickled our minds by tsunamis, tickled our minds by allowing half the world's population to watch the funeral of one man and the Bible begin to say in my head, the whole world shall wonder after that in such times as these that Adventist preachers are pulling out yellow notes and preaching all kinds of stuff when the fresh news of the prophecies of God's word ought to be filling our pulpits and some of this junk we're preaching ought to be cost set aside and we ought to be preaching stuff that's leading people to the ways of God. trying to sound like the boys and the other churches and wrapped up in style and trying to moan and grunt like the rest of the brethren. When God has given you a clear word, he's given this church an insight. He has given us the telescope. We can walk bravely 
through the chapters of Daniel and Revelation. And we don't have to apologize because God has given us this insight and we ought to be preaching it and not boring our people with socialite sermons that have nothing to do with nothing. Now that's all free, it's not in the notes at all, just. The books of Daniel and Revelation summon us to the quarters of their pages. The books of Daniel and Revelation wave a red flag at us saying, he he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Can you see him? Can you hear the angel's wings already? Do you see Orion getting fatter and wider so that thousands times ten thousands can pass through? Can't you hear Gabriel's trumpet blowing already? That's what you ought to be preaching. And so I've gone back uh, to these books, Daniel and Revelation. I'm preaching in my morning service, Daniel, in my afternoon service, Revelation, and then studying last day events on Wednesday night, just because you see, preachers, I want to be ready. See, unfortunately, on that day, in spite of churches built and souls baptized and tithes raised and in gatherings sit in and message magazines, subscriptions sent out, God ain't going to ask you nothing about that on Judgment Day. He wants to know, have you been true to your calling? So I've been back in Daniel and Revelation. And of course you realize these books are husband and wife. Daniel 12, 9 says that the book when finished was sealed until the time then Revelation 22.10 says, now everything is open. The two books are full of Jesus. They're full of Jesus. Daniel 2, he, he shows up riding on a rock that fills the whole earth. Daniel 3, he hobnobs with sinners in a furnace, cooling it by his very presence. You've preached it. Daniel 5, he shows up with a hand. (laughs) He just writes on a wall what's going to happen that night, and it does. In Daniel 7, we see Christ moving before the Father. Remember that vision? Son of man coming before the Father, a depiction of the, of the judgment to come. Daniel 9, he is predicted in the closing verses of that chapter. Daniel 10, Christ is seen wrestling against the prince of Persia, making sure that things come out just the way God said they would. And then in Daniel 12, he just stands up. You know, that's a bad brother when you just write a text that says, and when Michael stands up. You know, that's really an, un, an uneventful event, but, but when God stands up, it produces a text of scripture. Come on, y'all. <laughs> Revelation 1, he's in the midst of the candlesticks. Revelation 3, he's knocking at the door. We'll be back there in a minute. Revelation 5, he's Christ the Lamb. And in Revelation 6, he's Christ coming. Revelation 7, the Lamb in the midst of the throne. Revelation 10, Christ with the little book that must be eaten by the church, sweet to the taste but bitter to the stomach. Revelation 12, he's the little boy born and the devil waits on him. Revelation 14, the Lamb with the 144,000. Revelation 19, Christ triumphant in Revelation 22, Christ still coming. These books are the unveiling of the salvation of Jesus. Are you listening to me? 
I, I, I want to try something on you this evening. Uh, my subject is I have proof. I have proof. Will you listen to me for 30 minutes? Let's pray. Father, it's your moment. Amen. I believe with all my heart that we need to be preaching the book of Revelation and Daniel from a restoration standpoint. What word did I say? Restoration. Say it again. We ought to be, Brother King, investigating Daniel and Revelation from the standpoint of restoration. Now the restoring, Sister Brooks, of what? What are we restoring? Well, one need only read the first three chapters of the book of Revelation to understand why restoration is necessary. You recall, you recall that those first three chapters unveil the seven churches. Have you preached on those recently? Seven churches. Ephesus, the church that lost its love. If you studied the history of Ephesus, the city actually died because too much mud accumulated in the harbor. So Ephesus died because it had too much dirt. I thought I had preachers in this room. Uh, Ephesus moves to Smyrna. For when the church loses love, then the Lord sends it through Smyrna or the period of pain and testing and trial. And a good subject for Smyrna is no pain, no gain. And you talk about how that the Lord, in all of his love for us, will always do whatever is necessary to save us even to bringing us down with pain and misery and trial. You've preached it, haven't you? But every Christian in the church, every believer is either in an Ephesus stage or a Smyrna stage or a Pergamos stage of compromise, a Thyatira stage. Thyatira reaches the point where Jezebel is sitting in the church. Preach that. Talk about that. And talk about the fact that when you get to the 25th verse in Thyatira, that in spite of the fact that the church has reached the point where Jezebel abides in the pews, God says in the 25th verse, I see something there worth saving. Oh, shoot, y'all. Tell your members that no matter how low they go and how rough it gets and how far away they may, they may get from God, that even after the board votes, God still sees something worth saving. Tell your people. I just want to talk about it a little bit. And then you go to Sardis, the almost church. See, if you live in Thyatira long enough, you don't come right back. You do a Sardis. You get almost back. Jesus was upset with that church and complained to them that, that you've not yet gone as far as I want you to go because you see Reformation starts in Sardis and Reformation is not complete in your life until it goes as far as God wants it to go. They move from there to Philadelphia, the time of 1844 when the church thought Christ was coming and prepared themselves. Talk to your saints about that period. What happens to people when they really believe the Lord is coming? Talk about how they sold their houses and and divided up their crops and, and, got rid of their, and got rid of their material goods. Tell your people how they made up with one another, how the pews became sweet and pure, how people act when they believe that Jesus is coming. Preach on that. But in Laodicea, see that phrase in the Greek, I will spew out of my mouth. Sister Bradford, that's a terrible word. Uh, that word has to do with vomiting. The church has reached the point of such a hypocritical stage that it makes me upchuck, says Jesus. I've not forgotten what I'm talking about, restoration. By the time you get to the end 
of the seven churches. Now watch me. In Revelation 1, Jesus is seen standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Have you preached that? He's in the church. By the time you get to the end of Revelation 3, Jesus is standing outside the church, knocking, trying to get in. And the Bible says, if any man hear my voice, oh, he's not just knocking. He's calling to the church. But the music is so loud. And the gossip is so strong. And the malice between members has become so potently visible. And they're so concerned with holding their offices and the pastor about moving to the next largest church. They cannot hear Jesus calling. And so he must knock and call. And the Greek says, I have been knocking and I have been calling. Now, John is an old man. My subject is restoration. restoration. I'm dealing with that. I have proof. That's my subject. I have proof. I'm looking for some evidence. And by the time you get to the end of Revelation 3, the church is in a bad state. And the question that now rises who shall be saved? Now, you need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, preachers and prelates, that the history of the human race in the Bible is not good. I challenge you, Bible scholars tonight, Find me one text in the Bible that praises mankind. I'll sit down here, Mitch, and wait on you. There's none. There's not a text in the Bible where God says, we're wonderful. Why are you getting so quiet? There are texts that say he's wonderful. There are texts that say he's powerful. There's texts that say he's loving, but there's no text that says we're lovable. And this is why the Bible is really, it ain't about us. It's about him. And when you preach prophecy, you're preaching God's predicted response to man's awfulness. Unacceptable though we be and inconsistent though we are, uh, the Bible is full of God's determination. And when you read prophecy and you finally see uh, the number which no man can number standing on the sea of glass, you're not seeing man's goodness, you're seeing God's determination to save some garbage from the garbage. And so at the end of chapter, at the end of chapter three, uh, the church is in bad shape and, and John needs a lift. See, John has read the Bible. He knows that the human race, I mean, a perfect man, Adam, sinned. The best that the antediluvians had, Noah, got drunk. The father of the faithful Abraham would lie at the drop of a hat. <laughs> Judah, from whom Christ's line came, had sex with his own daughter-in-law, whom he thought was a whore. Folks, these words are in the Bible. Don't get upset. I'm just, these words are in the Bible. The word whore is in the Bible. It's a Bible word. Just like ass. Ass is in the Bible. Don't get me started now. Uh, 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 
the best we have, I mean, even Elijah, Elijah who stood with courage and pompousity on the tops of Carmel and called down fire in the name of God, ran like a rabbit from a woman. Now I'm listing the best we have. Yeah, this is Faith Hall of Fame. Moses. Don't mess with Moses. Had a temper would knock your head off and put you in the sand and bury you. I'm talking about the best we got. But I have proof. See, the problem is when, when you talk about Adam, and you read the fall of man in, in Genesis 3, you, 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 you find verse 8 saying, and the Lord God came down in the evening in the cool of the day. And, and, what you, and, and, and the, picture that, the picture that is painted is that there was a time when man had face-to-face -face communion with God. Are you listening to me? There was a time when God came down and would talk to Adam about how eyeballs worked. Would explain to him how the phalanges and the metatarsals were linked to the, to the body and, and, and how the patella and the femur bones were the strongest in the body. He explained, he, God and Adam talked face to face about how the eardrum worked and, and how flowers open up in the process of photosynthesis. Adam and God had face to face communion, but sin came in. I'm talking about restoration. And even though after that time, we had many good folks come along, they, they could not look God in the eye because God is a consuming fire to sin. And it didn't get any better. By the time, my brother, you get down to David, the best king. David was the best king. I said David was the best king we could come up with. Lying, cheating, wife stealing David was the best king we had. And then the almost best king, Solomon. I wonder how he handled his gift list around Christmas time. <laughs> These are the best and you need to preach out of Revelation and say to the people that it's the condition of man that makes God so great. It's our lowness that makes him so high. It's our unlovableness that makes him so loving. It's the distance between me and God that makes him a bridge over troubled water. It's not about us, it's about God. And so, in Revelation 4, John needs a lift. I wish the saints would say with me. He needs a lift. The church is in bad shape. Laodicea is dripping all over the church and hypocrisy is running through the church and John needs some encouragement because right now he cannot imagine that anybody, even in the church, is going to be saved. Oh, he remembers that Enoch went up, but nobody knows where. He recalls that, that, that John saw Moses and Elijah on Mount Transfiguration, but he's not sure where they came from. Talking about John's perspective now, he doesn't know. What he knows is, is that the face-to-face -face communion has been broken. And then in Revelation 4, turn there. Revelation 4, yeah. I ought to use the Bible once before I shut up. Revelation 4. Look yonder. After this, I looked and behold. Now, notice the transition. I love the drama of the Bible. You see, Jackie, at the end of Revelation 3, Jesus is standing outside knocking. If any man will hear my voice, I'll come in and sup with him. It's a bad scene. And suddenly, like a good movie, there's a transition. And now the camera gets away from earth and aims straight up through Orion. And the Bible says, behold, a door was opened in heaven. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. See, when things aren't going good, get your mind off your bills and look at the bill payer. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. When, 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 when your family is falling apart, get your mind off your home and, and remember the family of God. Know that the God you serve has already specialized in human mess. He's not intimidated by it. Even your limping, half-stepping ministry sometimes does not, does not intimidate God. He just goes on and uses you anyhow. Some of us know we're not living right. Get in the pulpit and the Holy Ghost comes down on you and you're preached like a house set afire. Don't think for one minute because you suddenly turn good. Because God is good. And you the best thing he's got to use that day so he goes on and uses you anyhow. Somebody say amen out there. Somebody gets up and walks down the aisle, joins your church, your life's not right. Don't think you suddenly have died and become an angel because six folk join your church one Sabbath. God just decided this is the best thing I got to work with. I got six souls here. Let me use this raunchy Negro and get these people down this aisle. So John, so John, I just got a few minutes left now, brother. And John, John, John is seen, he's seen looking up. But as he looks, see, I have proof. <laughs> as he looks, he sees God, he sees the throne, he sees the jasper, he sees the rainbow, he sees the emerald color. Then verse four, and round about the throne were four and 20 seats. Now the seats are around the throne. Oh shoot, y'all. <laughs> the seats. <laughs> now the only thing closer is on the throne. But there are 24 seats John saw him, I got proof. Hey, hey, they're around the throne. Now, all of a sudden, I'm caught up with John. Who in the world is this? Verse 10, the four and 20 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory. It sounds good, they're singing. They're singing, but I need to know who they are. I gotta keep reading. I got to go to chapter five and the scene opens further. And in verse nine, it tells me what they're singing. And they sang a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou wast slain mm -mm, and hast redeemed uh -oh, us. So there's some redeemed folk here singing. Hallelujah. Us. Yes. Now my mind is really that us. Who's us? To God by thy blood out of every, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Every kindred. Yes. Tongue. Yes. People. Yes. And nation. Yes. There are folks up there. Oh shoot y'all, there's folks up there. Yes. Yeah, there's folks from down here up there. Yes. People who walk down here are up there. People who once were in sin and liked sin and loved sin and did sin and smelled sin and ate sin and drank sin have something has happened down inside of them and they've reached the point where now they can sit and look God in the eye. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I got proof. <laughs> I got proof that you can make it and that I can make it. Now there's 24. I don't know what that means, 24 nations. There are 24 nations. I don't know what that means. I really could care less about the number. I just know that now I got hope because people who used to be where I live, who came from, from where I have struggled, and people like you are now sitting in the presence of God. I got proof. Now it helps my spirit now 
Makes me want to keep on reading in Revelation. And now I'm in the seventh chapter. And the number now is 144,000. And they're also standing around the throne. I got proof. (laughs) The number has grown (laughs) from 24 to 144,000. Still a tight number. Still squeezing. Still hard to make it in. But I'm inspired now to keep on reading. And I've gotten to the ninth chapter. And I see a number, which no man can number, standing on the sea of glass, standing by the throne of God. I got proof. that word blessed your heart. Come on, let's sing together. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and come on. Redeemed. Redeemed. child and for this is a serious moment our people are struggling folk They have children who have been captured by the internet. Our young people are more educated, but more irreverent. The young couples of our church are bound with the disease of materialism. There's a smaller percentage of them returning tithe to the church. And the Adventist ministry must meet the challenge with fervent, deeply studied, incisively applicable, and inspiringly effective preaching of the Bible. We have a sure word of prophecy. I said we have a sure word of prophecy. Nobody can preach this stuff like we can preach it. Nobody. Nobody, dogger, can unfold those seven seals and explain those seven trumpets and and break down those seven churches. Nobody. Nobody. And our people need to hear that stuff. But you can make it inspiring and spiritual. You can tell the people that that these are not strange books, but they're practical books, and you can get in there and dig at it and and work with it and and pump it and and go back and pray and cry unto God for understanding. Walk in the pulpit on Sabbath with something really to say. I ain't talking about no Friday night foolishness now. I'm talking about you at least started on Sunday morning and worked on that thing on Monday morning and it got hot on Tuesday morning and began to, it began to sizzle on Wednesday morning and, and by Thursday it was so hot you could hardly hold the notes and by the time Sabbath morning comes, you're like a horse waiting for the bell to ring and you, you cannot keep silent because God has grabbed a hold of your heart. That's what I'm talking about. Don't insult the Lord by saying you don't have anything to preach on Sabbath. You ought to slap your own face if you say that. 
The Bible is deep and rich, but every page ekes out Jesus. Every text has got some Jesus in it. And in these days and times, the folk need to hear it. So my appeal, my appeal to us is to recommit ourselves to true Seventh-day Adventist preaching. That's my appeal, that we make up our mind that some stuff we won't be spending any time on because our people don't have time for it. And if you're not a preacher and you're in this congregation and you just want to recommit yourself to, to, to this message, it's a powerful message. I mean, sometimes on Sabbath, I just can't wait. I just can't wait. Stop preliminary. Cut them out. Sing the hymn fast. <laughs> Cut the 10 minute gospel song down to five minutes. Let me get up and run with Jesus in the pulpit. But you gotta study. You gotta dig. You gotta pray, you gotta cry. Cause every sermon you preach cuts you up first. Remember, you're the biggest problem in your sermon. A sinner saved by grace. And God condescends to come down on Henry Wright, ugly and, and, and unclean as I am. He comes down on me and, and electrifies me and my eyes burn with fire and my, my voice trembles with anticipation and my body is electrocuted by the power of the gospel and he uses me one more time. You've got to be committed to that. For 41 years, I've been doing it. And sometimes my lungs ache so bad, like they're aching now. That's why I sit down. I got bad lungs, y'all. The older I get, the worse they get. But if God just gives me 20 minutes to preach, I'll give him all I got. One day I will not be able to open this voice and preach, and I know it. But as long as he gives me power and strength, I will preach like a man who believes in the God that has saved him. So if you will stand with me in commitment to this Adventist faith, yeah. come on, y'all, get on up off your feet. Because I got proof tonight. I got proof. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We going in. Amen. Did you see it? We going in. Bird, come on, man. We going in. Yes, You're a fine young pastor of the gospel. Don't preach yourself and be a castaway. Lead them in. Don't follow them in. Lead them in. But if it gets rough and you got to follow them in, just get in. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. My good friend, Murray Joyner, I want you to come up here and pray for us. Murray and I started together in Mississippi. Pray, Murray, that we'll be committed to this message as believers, as preachers, that we'll preach it and live it with all our strength. Pray for us. Let us bow. Heavenly Father, we have heard a joyful sound. Jesus saves. To the utmost, Jesus saves. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my servant die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Lord, we're just so glad we are not left alone here in this meeting, hopeless, invalids, and orphans. But Lord, by your grace, and through the word that was spoken tonight, we hear that you have taken us and put your arms around us. You have adopted us and called us to be sons of God. Lord, tonight, first, we ask that you would forgive us. Forgive us of our sins, our mistakes, where we've been caught up in stupidity and foolishness. But Lord, tonight, we are standing because we have, are responding to that which is most beautiful, the love of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Lord, thank you for this beautiful gospel that we're heard tonight. 
the gospel of restoration, the gospel of peace to our wayfaring souls. Thank you for Henry Wright, your servant. Let your blessing continue to be upon him and keep him and his lungs as long as you see fit. And bless us tonight in this beautiful symposium, these workshops. Let us, Lord, tonight, as we stand, recommit ourselves to the three angels' messages. Yes, sir. Not some foolish opinions, but let it be based on the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Thank you so much. And help us, Lord, to know that every time we stand in the pulpit, somebody is being drawn closer to God. Thank you again for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who has called us tonight. And thank you for the message we heard this evening. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask it all. Everybody said.